Welcome to part three of topic three, perfect competition. And in this particular presentation, we're going to continue on with market failure. And in particular, we're going to look at um, a carbon tax versus a cap and trade. So this is a quite a, a quite an advanced extension of what we've been doing in terms of competitive markets. Um, now, what I advise you to do at this stage is that following this slide, there are four slides which go through in a lot of detail and explain this diagram and explain this example. So it would be best if you uh, read those four slides. They do uh, sort of relate back to this diagram. Try to develop as much of an understanding as you can and then come back and listen to this recording and we'll go through it together. I think it'll really help if you do uh, read the four slides so it'll give you an idea of what I'll be talking about. Um, and I'm advising that because this is a reasonably complex example that we're going through. So I'll give you time to do that. Okay, so you should have read those four slides. And what we've got here is a diagram with two firms. And both firms are creating pollution. We have a low marginal abatement cost firm. That's sort of the yellow or mustard colored line. And then a high marginal abatement cost firm. So two firms. Now, starting off from the bottom left-hand corner, uh, we are going to assume we're going to start looking at the low marginal abatement cost firm first. We are assuming that for each unit of output that firm produces, it produces a corresponding unit of pollution. So one unit of output, one unit of pollution. So starting the bottom left-hand corner near the zero, firm the low marginal cost firm will will move uh, left to right along the horizontal axis and that firm's marginal sorry maximum production is the distance between zero and zero prime so the the length of the horizontal axis is the maximum or shows the maximum amount the low marginal abatement cost firm can actually produce and for each unit of production there's one unit of pollution so along the horizontal axis, we could think of it as measuring output or pollution. It's a one-for-one -one, uh, relationship, so either's fine. So with the low cost firm, as it moves from the bottom left-hand corner at zero there to the right, it is producing more and more units of output. It is therefore producing more and more units of pollution. And this upward sloping yellow line shows the cost of actually eliminating each unit of pollution. So initially, for the first few units of pollution, it's very cheap to actually get rid of that pollution. But as we move from left to right for this low cost firm, as it tries to eliminate more and more pollution associated with its production, the costs just steadily rise and rise and rise. Okay, so on the horizontal axis from left to right, the low cost firm is producing more output, it is therefore producing more pollution, and the cost associated with actually cleaning up that pollution are given by the yellow lines, and that those costs just rise on a per unit basis. For the high marginal abatement cost firm, same sort of story, we just go the other way. So for the high cost firm, we start off over here, bottom right hand corner, and its production goes from zero prime, so it's not producing anything at zero prime, and we move to the left and maximum production occurs at uh, point zero. Now as the high cost firm moves from right to left, once again more output, more pollution, and this blue line shows the cost to that firm of cleaning up each unit of pollution. So the idea is the first couple of units of pollution are going to be cheap to actually um, clean up. You might just have to tweak your production process in a very minor way, purchase some very cheap equipment to get rid of that pollution. But as you try and get rid of more and more and more pollution, the cost of each extra unit of pollution that you want to get rid of rises because you have to take uh, more expensive, more dramatic uh, steps to the production process to actually get rid of more and more pollution. So it's just more costly to get rid of each unit of pollution. 
Okay, so what we actually want to do here, uh, if, if you have a look in this diagram, with no intervention, we have an amount of pollution um, equal to, well, we could, we could assume that each firm is polluting um, an amount equal to the distance represented by the horizontal axis. So for the low cost firm, let's just assume that that firm is actually producing zero to zero prime units of output and it's producing that much pollution as well. The high cost firm, it's producing zero prime to zero units of output, that much pollution, so the total amount of pollution is uh, two times the distance of the horizontal axis. Now that is just in a competitive, unregulated market. Now let's assume that the government steps in and they're considering either a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. Now under the carbon tax, a tax is imposed on pollution equal to the dotted line between tax and tax. So this line here. Now if that is the tax, let's now think about how, and that tax is actually set at the intersection of those two curves because what we actually want to do is halve the level of pollution here. We want the total pollution across the two firms to simply equal zero, zero prime, the distance of the horizontal axis. So we want to cut it in half. That tax is deliberately set at the intersection point there to achieve that desired level of pollution. So let's consider what the or how the low cost firm reacts to the imposition of a tax. Starting off here, the firm will produce the first unit of output. Now for that first unit of output, the firm has two choices. The firm knows that producing that first unit of output will actually produce pollution. There's two options. The first one is to clean up that pollution and incur the cost given, given by the yellow line or the, f the other option is to produce that first unit, generate the pollution, and pay the tax. Okay, so I'll say that again. For the first unit, they could either produce the output but clean up the pollution, or produce the output, create the pollution, and pay the tax. Now, for the first unit, it's quite a simple decision. The tax is much higher than the cost of cleaning up, so this firm will actually clean up. The same argument can be made for all of the units between zero and E star for the low cost firm. For all of those units, the cost of abatement is well below the tax. Once this firm hits point E star and produces beyond that, then the cost of abatement is so high that it is cheaper for them, for, uh, for the firm to then simply pay the tax and pollute. So what's this firm done? It's actually reduced its pollution by zero to E star. Same sort of logic for the high cost firm. It will start off on the right hand bottom or in the right hand bottom corner at zero prime. It will then produce its first unit, which is going to be around about here. It'll look at that and think to itself, well, it is cheaper for me to produce that unit and clean up the pollution and incur that abatement cost rather than produce the first unit, not clean up the pollution and pay the tax, which is much higher. The same sort of logic occurs for all of the units between zero and, sorry, zero prime and E star for the high cost firm. This firm will, for all of the units between zero prime and E star, pay the abatement cost, that is clean up the pollution and incur that abatement cost, rather than paying the tax. But beyond E star, for the high cost firm, it will be much cheaper to pay the tax rather than incurring these high abatement costs. So, to summarise that, 
the low cost firm has reduced its pollution by zero to E star. The high cost firm has reduced its pollution by zero prime E star. So what we've actually done here is reduce pollution by the horizontal distance of the of, by the distance of the horizontal axis. Now previously both firms were polluting um, or creating an amount of pollution equal to the distance represented by the horizontal axis. So we've actually halved the level of pollution by getting these firms to, to do it this way. Okay, so that's the effect of a tax and it's important to set the tax at the right level so that you do actually um, generate the result of having pollution halved. If we set the tax higher, then the level of pollution reduction would be even greater. If we set the tax lower than the existing level here in this diagram, then we wouldn't have enough abatement. So the level of the tax does actually control the level of pollution abatement and therefore the level of remaining pollution. Now let's consider a cap and trade system. The cap and trade system is basically a system whereby each of these two companies, and there's only these two companies in the world, each of these two companies are given by the government permits to pollute. And we're going to keep it nice and simple and assume that each company is given the same number of permits to pollute. So they're both given, in terms of the number of permits, 0 to E. So in a way, where it, in this market we are allowing 0 to 0 prime units of pollution. In this market, that's the maximum amount of, ma maximum amount of pollution we're allowing. And we're saying to these firms, you can have an equal number of permits, and so combined, they will be able to, their, their combined uh, pollution will be equal to zero, zero prime. But what this diagram shows us is that if they are initially given the same number of permits, zero to E, it's beneficial for them to actually begin trading those permits. Now in this case, what will happen is we will end up at E star. So even though we started off at E where both companies were polluting the same amount, we will end up at E star where the low cost firm is, is polluting a lot less than the high cost firm. So then the question is how do we get from E to E star? Well the way we're actually going to get there is that the high cost firm will actually buy some pollution permits off the low cost firm. And how many permits will be bought? The distance E to E star. So E to E star represents units of pollution and in this cap and trade extension of this example it also represents permits. So we're assuming that we have one per there's one permit exists in the marketplace for each unit of pollution. So the high cost firm will buy E to E star permits allowing them to increase their pollution by that amount. So then the next question is well how does this actually work? We know that the low cost firm will sell some permits to the high cost firm but how does this actually work? Well what we're effectively doing is we are saying to the low cost firm you have a number of the num a number of pollution permits equal to 0 E or half its current pollution level so what the low cost firm would do before trading is it would have 0 E permits to pollute. So for units 0 to E of production pollution, 
that company would actually clean up or produce those units and clean up that pollution because they are the cheapest units to actually clean up. However, for the low cost firm, for the units between E and zero prime, they're the higher cost abatement units. They would use their permits to permit them to, which would permit them to actually undertake that pollution. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. For the low cost firm, it would still produce an amount of output equal to the distance along the horizontal axis from zero to zero prime. However, for units zero to E, the low cost firm will actually incur those low abatement costs and clean up pollution. And then that firm would be given a quantity of permits E to zero prime, which would then allow them to pollute in uh, pollute or rather create sorry create pollution associated with um, the output or units of output e to zero prime. Now the high cost firm, the logic there is the same. With the initial cap system but no trade, the high cost firm starts off at zero prime and it will actually pay all of these abatement costs up to the vertical cap line. Then for the higher cost abatement, it will actually not clean up that particular pollution but use its permits to allow it to actually um, pollute to that extent and not clean it up. But what we can do is generate a better outcome. So what would happen is at the moment for these units of pollution from E star to E that the high cost firm is cleaning up the high cost firm would think to itself, for those units of pollution from E star to E that I'm currently cleaning up, that is incurring me a cost of DFG. That is the total monetary cost to the high cost firm of cleaning up the units between E star and E. But the, the key issue here is that to clean up the, um, that pollution, you could actually have the low cost firm do it. So if the low cost firm was to extend its abatement from zero to E to also include units E to E star, then the low cost firm could clean up those units at a cost of G. So rather than having the high cost firm clean up those units between E and E star at a cost of D, F, G, you could get well, the high cost firm could ask the low cost firm to do it at a much lower cost of G. So what we're actually doing is for these units between E and E star of pollution, we are getting the low cost firm to take on the burden of uh, abatement there at a much cheaper cost. Now, obviously, um, there's got to be some sort of monetary transfer associated with that because what's literally happening is the low cost firm is giving the high cost firm some, some of its uh, pollution permits so that the high cost firm can now pollute units E star to E but the low cost firm will want money in return. So what is the maximum amount of money that the high cost firm is willing to pay to avoid having to reduce its pollution for the units E star to E. Well, the maximum amount of money the high cost firm would be willing to give up, give up is D, F, G. That's what it would cost to clean up. So that's the maximum amount, or DFG is the amount of money that the high cost firm would have to pay to actually abate 
those units between E star and E. So DFG is the maximum amount of money that the high cost firm would be willing to pay the low cost firm to purchase the pollution permits which the low cost firm is willing to hand over. And the minimum amount of money that the low cost firm is willing to receive for those production of uh, the pollution permits which would allow the high cost firm to produce more but force the low cost firm to uh, to pollute um, less and therefore undertake more abatement the minimum amount is G. G is the amount of money that the uh, that it would cost the low cost firm to increase its pollution abatement from E out to E star. So what we can see here is that in terms of transferring pollution permits from the low cost firm to the high cost firm, which then f allows the high cost firm to pollute more, but forces the low cost firm to pollute less, there's a difference between what the high cost firm is willing to pay and what the low cost firm is willing to receive. Low cost firm only needs G high cost firms willing to pay DFG. The difference DF is the area that I mentioned in the, in the following slides and DF is going to be an amount that is shared between the two companies, two firms, based upon their bargaining power. So if I was the high cost firm I might go along to the low cost firm and say for those pollution permits that will allow me to increase my pollution from zero prime E star to zero prime E, I'm willing to pay you the area FG. But the low cost firm may counter that offer by saying, well, we want FG plus one third of D. So how DF, the areas DF, are split between the two firms is going to be dependent upon their relative bargaining positions. So with a cap and trade system, hopefully you can see that we do end up at the same outcome as the tax. With under the cap and trade system, we will now have the high cost firm abating units zero prime E star and then polluting for units E star through to zero. And for the low cost firm under a cap and trade, it will be abating for units zero out to E star and then polluting for units E star out to zero prime. So the same result under the two systems.